and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly. Chant these words three times in your mind. The hero appears. The hero appears. The hero appears. And I'm Matt Freeman. And if you do that, I'll come to you from the planet Ping Pong. Yay! This week on the show, we are doing another one of our patron-produced episodes. For those of you that do not know, folks who pledge to us at the Doof Warrior level or above on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash doofmedia, get to select a movie, short story, or in this case, a short season of TV for us to do a topic on. This week, patron Nuke Noodles once again has asked us to do an anime, Matt, and we are taking a look at the 2014 Japanese animation Ping Pong, the the animation. Yep. <laughs> Great title. <laughs> yeah. Then we are going to talk about the brand new shiny Star Wars trailer and wrap this week's episode up with some fun industry talk, which is everyone's favorite segment. I know it's mine. All right. Without further ado, Matt, let's just get right into it and let's talk about Ping Pong the animation. Uh, this will be a full spoilers discussion. So if you are worried about us spoiling who wins the Ping Pong tournament, Turn it off and go watch the show. When did you learn to play like this? Starting today, I don't want you thinking about anything other than table tennis. I'm not interested in shiny medals. That's not why I play. Your boy sure breaks the mold, doesn't he? Incredibly talented. But he doesn't give a lick about winning. No napping, Skimoto. Hey, you can't leave. Better respond to that crap. And here I thought I was doing right by the boy. Setbacks and defeats. Isolation and turmoil. You feel it, right? You feel it chasing you. The hero appears. The hero appears! That's it, boy! Prove you can return it! The hero appears. The hero appears. There are no heroes. Are you kidding? I'm the hero of this story, and don't you dare forget. You know, it's it's 11 episodes. They're each about 20 minutes, right? So mm-hmm. all, all, all things told, it, it's basically a long movie, you know? Yes. So it's, it's one, it's... I guess you'd call it one season, but that's all there is, right? There's not a second season. It's, there is it's not. Self-contained. And as far as I know, I don't think there's plan. I mean, sure, certainly the end of this thing does not warrant yeah. more seasons. Yeah, my understanding is that this is this is it. This is the story. Yeah. So ping pong is like most of the animes we've covered, based off of a man- manga, manga, whatever. I don't know. I don't know your anime people's terms. Um, it's this manga but. of of the same name I, I think i think honestly this is an episode where we're probably going to do a lot of mispronouncing because yes we're so so before the before we started recording scott and i had like an eight minute conversation <laughs> just trying to nail down who is who because there's so many characters in the show mm-hmm. and a lot of them are introduced and this is Okay. First off, I, I like the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna be saying a lot of good stuff about this, sh- and, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff the show is doing. Um, one one of the things that I don't think is great is that it introduces a ton of characters really fast and doesn't necessarily kind of flag you on the fact that they're gonna be important, or at yeah. least at least that's the way my brain works. Is I'm like, all right, am I do I need to care about this character and remember their name? And and in many cases, I didn't realize until slightly too late that I was supposed to be paying attention to certain characters. Um, yeah, but, I, I, yeah, I would say it's very abrupt with with some of the characters, especially ones that end up being super, super important. You're right. Um, also, a lot of the characters are are bald Japanese men um, and the art style, while interesting, and I think we're going to have some good things to say about the art style. It's also very sparse on detail. So there's like a bunch of bald men. Yeah. And I which is the one. Right. I mean, they they were nice enough to us when you when you actually break down the important characters that are bald, um, you realize that there's the one no glasses, there's one with glasses, and there's one with really big eyebrows. Right. Um, but until you really have got that centered, you're like, wait, what? And then one of them he grows his hair out later, and I didn't realize it was the same gay <laughs> guy. Uh, Peiko does the same thing too, where he retires from ping pong for a while, grows his hair out, and I was like. Wait, who is this? Yeah, I totally didn't realize that was Peiko <laughs> until basically after that scene was over. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, that was oh, okay. Retroactively, that was that was Peiko. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. But uh, honestly, pretty minor complaint though, because eventually you figure out who everybody is. Yes, by it the eleventh was- episode, I had a firm <laughs> grasp on who everyone was. Yeah, it was just a bit of a struggle to get there. But um, yeah, and I, and I think yeah. we have to say that at least part of that is the fact that we are two Americans 
uh, to which their Japanese names really are difficult to grasp onto. Like it's, yeah. it's really, it, it's difficult for me to have a hook for these names. I, I appreciate that each one of these characters had a, um, a nickname cause the nicknames were very easy to grasp onto. Yeah. See, you say that, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was the debate we just had was who exactly was demon. <laughs> and I was, and I was, and I had demon and dragon confused, which, you know, sorry. Um, they're very different characters. Yeah. But no, no, think... like, like, if it, like, I think that's what's funny is eventually they all proved themselves to be very well drawn and very distinct characters. Yeah. Um, it, you know, ultimately it just takes a while to get going. Sure. So let, let's back up. We, yeah. we kind of, we jumped in, let's back up. Um, this is an anime about ping pong in the most literal definition of those words possible. It is a Japanese animation that is entirely about ping pong. That's it. I was kind of waiting for something crazy to happen. And there's moments throughout the story where you think maybe it's going to go a weird anime -y way um, at the beginning. But it doesn't. That's just a lot of good metaphor and symbology going on in this anime that's strictly just about people playing table tennis. Um, Matt, what did you think of ping pong overall? I liked it a lot. Um, I really liked the animation. I liked the way the animation was was animated in a movement sense. Um, I liked some of the visual conceits of like the panels and sequential kind of like, like cu cutting, cutting the frame apart with panels. Um, I, I liked the characters. I thought that um, basically uh, how to phrase it. It's a sports, it's a sports show. Okay. It's like, yeah. the, that's the genre it is. It's a sports show. It definitely hits every single sports show trope, but that doesn't mean there's not room for originality. I thought sure. that the um, China character was was fresh. I was like, oh, I haven't. I, I, I'm fascinated by this character. I, I I feel like I'm being exposed to to like a bunch of feelings and ideas that I'm not familiar with, um, or that I've never seen before, rather. And 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 just just overall, I, I felt like yes, it, it hewed to the tropes pretty closely, but also there was there there was twists and turns and surprises and a lot of room for character development and, and and fun character stuff, which is really kind of what I'm here for. And so overall, my verdict is that I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, mainly because I enjoyed the characters. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how'd you feel? Well, I have a confession to make, Matt, and I don't know if this is something I've ever talked about on this show before, but I love sports movies. Uh -huh. I love them. Sports movies, sports television shows. I love a good sports story. It's just they're just fun. They, they build to this perfect escalation point. Like the, it's always, like, it's always the big game at the end. And it's just a, a great way of, of transferring dialogue into a, a visual me or not dialogue, transferring character and, and, and conflict into a visual medium. Sports just is the easiest way to do it. Like, I mean, obviously Rocky is one of my favorite movies. It's cause it's a boxing, it's a sports movie. Um, yeah. So, there was a lot of this I enjoyed because of that. Um, it is still an anime. Um, it is still not my favorite thing in the world. And there were moments in this that it's anime Enis really struggled. I, I struggled to get through it at times. I mean, like you said, this is 11 episodes. It's not very long. Um, it, it was kind of a struggle at times for me to click play the next episode. But uh, I think I think what you were saying is correct that that our core four characters, which are Peiko, Dragon, Smile, and uh, and and Wenge, uh, China, who I think like they put his uh, on the Wikipedia they put him as China, but really I mean to me that was derogatory because that wasn't actually his nickname. They were just like I don't want to have to bother learning Kong's name. Let's just call him China. But yeah, sure, I, whatever. And I don't I don't even understand if was Kong also a nickname. I, I think I that's his name. Okay. I, I, I just think that's his name. Because I but don't know how to say Wenge. W I thought it was Wenge. I thought, I don't know. I, think, I don't know. Well, I think that's what was kind of interesting is is the Chinese characters spoke Mandarin to each other. Yes. And when they say his name in Mandarin, it sounds different. Sure. Than, yeah. than when the Japanese characters say it, um, in, which, which makes in our sense. Dubbed, in our dubbed English, yes. That's, yeah, yeah. that's also a factor, yeah. Yes. I, that, this is yet again a reason why we're going to butcher all the pronunciation, but yeah, um, yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot to enjoy here. I think that, that the core four are all interesting characters who are taking very different journeys. Um, of course, the, the heart of the entire series is the relationship between uh, Peko and... Um, 
I don't know. I said Peco, Peco, and smile. Um, that's the most important core heart of the series, and I thought that was a very touching story. Um, I, I I was kind of surprised that Peco ended up being really the protagonist. Like, I mean, I, I think it's something we can talk about is is how like. I kept going back and forth as like, which one of these guys is supposed to be the protagonist? Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was Smile for most of the show. Yeah. And and I thought it was really cool, actually, because th- that's one character type where I kept expecting Smile to fit a certain anime trope that I, th- I thought that's what they were doing with Smile. And they really subverted me there because, like, I, I mean, I guess, you know, succinctly... The smile that you see in the flash forward at the end of the show is like, oh, so he just like mellows out. Yeah, he does. There's there's not there, there's not like a big. He never even really gets the moment of like smashing through his barriers as a human being and transforming into a beautiful phoenix, right? He just he 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 looks forward to his match with Peiko. He, he actually refuses to go easy on Peiko but not like in a brutally mean way it's just like for him that's that's not that's not their dynamic and it's and 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 he doesn't want to yeah and he feels like it would be a kind of betrayal of of what exists between them and then I I adore that they don't show that they don't show the match in that they just yeah they don't show who wins we get to see it in like a, a photo yeah as they're in the future as they're going through because that I mean and I love that because it doesn't matter at that point. Yeah. The point is that these two friends, these two best friends who found each other and bonded over ping pong, that Peko brought ping pong to this poor kid that was being bullied and and brutalized because they are not like other people. And that was the one thing. I, I, the reveal that he's called Smile not because he doesn't, but because when he is playing ping pong or or when he was playing ping pong that he would, Uh that it was one of the things that truly made him happy is one of the most heartwarming moments in, uh, in stories. I think I really, I really enjoyed that. I I was like, that is, that is well-earned. That's a well-earned reveal story. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool moments in here. I I was just thinking about that last game where, um, smile basically like crashes through the barrier and, but manages to hit the ball and, and you see Peiko yell out, like obviously concerned for him. And then when he sees that Smile gets up, he's like, heads up. And he's clearly going to return it, even though, even though <laughs> Smile just, and it's like, and that, and that's perfect because that's, that's their dynamic. Like he's not going to go easy on him, but he, right. he does care about him. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they push each other like that. But, but again, it's, it's just, it's, it's a bit off from what you would expect, kind of the just normal straight line. Like, okay. Yeah. There's the, uh, I mean, they definitely have the the trope of the genius, the and and then the hard worker, but then they kind of play with that too because it's like, well, Smile is a genius, but he's also a hard worker. In fact, all right. these guys are hard workers. They, they they don't really have the stereotype of like the guy who doesn't even have to try. These are all really hard workers. I mean, Peiko is definitely that character at the beginning, mm-hmm. the one who doesn't really try, who's naturally yeah. talented, doesn't really work at it, and then he comes back around by the end um smile is kind of that i I am like i was very out on this at the beginning because smile to me at the beginning of the story seemed like that anime trope and you know exactly what i'm talking about like Uh the quiet cocky too cool like yeah like he came off like that he came off as this just like indifferent i don't give a shit about anyone or anything and i'm just here and and i think that's really cool character um, and Mike, I think the reason why my, <laughs> I don't like those characters is because Michael loves those characters. <laughs> and like, so Michael, it was like Michael's favorite character always. And I was like, oh, I hate these characters. And so when I thought he was our main protagonist, I was like, I'm not going to like this. This is going to be a pain in the ass. And I was so glad that, first of all, that is not who he is. We, we kind of learned that slowly throughout the, the course of the series that that is really that has how he comes off. And that is one of the reasons why he is alienated from his peers. Um, but that's not who he is. And then also he's not really the main character. He's one of them, but there are so many other characters in this and each of those characters goes through a journey. And yeah, I think you're right that this is very standard kind of, um, sports story archetypal stuff like, um, but I mean, that always works on me. Like that, that is just like the idea of, 
the guy who loses the first time and then comes back having learned a lesson to win the the idea of someone who loses like committed everything to the game and then loses and then has to rethink their life i'm glad you talked about kong because i think his arc is one of the more interesting ones to me because like i really thought he was going to come in that second year and win or or at least get far enough to like earn Mm -hmm. a spot in the finals like to get out because this whole thing is getting out of 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 china or out of uh, japan yeah um and and regaining honor and i just love where his story went oh yeah totally as speaking of heart-wrenching moments like his his whole thing especially toward the beginning of the story is that he's he's super cool in a way that's way more offensive than the way smile is super cool yeah um, I, I was like I, I was like there are gonna be two of these yeah <laughs> that's right. basically my response like he's got the hair going on and, and he and he's so arrogant like he's way more overtly arrogant while smile is just kind of like this cold cockiness um and then he gets and and then we we get to, i think this is what i love about this actually is is the subtle touches that humanize the characters and make you realize sure. that the character that you're seeing at the at the start of the show is basically a facade that they are holding up because mm-hmm. when you look at his flashback where he's thinking about his mom and like you see him in his cool badass self like get on the train to leave and he has his sunglasses on and he's not even looking at his mom. And then the train pulls away and you're like, oh, this, you know, this guy. And then as then like as soon as he's out of sight of his mom, he like breaks down. And you're like, oh, he's a he's a person. Like, yeah. like these are all actually r- realistic characters. And the part of them that you're seeing and that you're mapping the anime trope onto usually falls away or or like cracks at some point, and you realize, like, oh, they're they're all pretty interesting and dynamic characters. Like yeah, I mean, one of the silliest elements to me was um, Dragon in the toilet. Like he would, he would spend the whole like first part of the match in the toilet watching like water running, and you're like, man, what a what a silly weird anime thing. And then and then <laughs> and then eventually it's revealed. It's like, oh, this is like this terribly sad thing for him actually because of his backstory. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not that I and, fully understand what that was, but. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I mean, like that. I mean, we we do have some critiques of the show uh-huh. that we're gonna probably go through. I, I agree with you. I, I like starting with the positive stuff first. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I agree that's very good. And one of the things I really like is, you know, we've talked a little bit about the animation, but I, like I like that each one of these characters has like a symbol that is associated with them. And and one of the thing I really like about Kong is the airplane yes. right like this is this recurring beat throughout kong's entire story because his whole goal is to get out of here and so you know throughout the matches the, these matches are very stylized to the point where like j- just people playing ping pong in the show called ping pong doesn't actually happen very often <laughs> because the, the animation so stylized that would like just the, like the back and forth of ping pong is not something we see at all um and i'm kind of glad for it because i don't want to watch people play ping pong yeah <laughs> i really don't want to do that it, it, um yeah. I, I learned nothing about ping pong watching this this show oh really like nothing I, I i didn't know see it's funny you say that because i didn't know about like different sides of the of the uh uh whatever the thing is called the racket having different materials that cause like yeah. one of them causes backspin one of them doesn't and yeah i i, I didn't know about that before and i still don't <laughs> I know they do different things. <laughs> okay, yeah. I yeah. don't know what those things are. Yeah. Like, like it's like, oh, pips. Oh, no, no. I, like, his pips are so long. What does that yeah, mean? <laughs> I think the closest thing to, to a learning was, like, realizing that, um, and this made sense as soon as I realized it, but, like, you're not playing the ball, you're playing the player, and, like, you, sure. you're basically watching their movements to see where the ball is going to go, because if you wait until you see them hit the ball, that's too late. You're, you're not going to mm-hmm. make it. Um Yeah. Uh, which 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 makes it a much more psychological game, which actually in my mind made it work better for a show like this. Yeah, yeah. So I agree, and I mean it's it's a sport that there's a lot of endurance involved, actually, deceptively because you're running around. Yeah, it's mental endurance and physical endurance at the same time. I, I'm not complaining that I didn't learn anything about ping pong. <laughs> I don't care about ping pong. Like I like playing it every once in a while, but I I will never be good enough to actually like be able to do crazy spinny things. So I, I, I think it I think it worked just enough to get to to buy me into what was going on without like inundating me with all the stuff. But I just thought it was very funny that like none of this I fit like, sure. oh, he's such a good chopper. Yeah. 
What? What? Okay. What's that? Sure. Are you I, gonna explain? No, no you're not. Okay. No, I understand. I understand that they're impressed by him, and that's what's important. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I, exactly. I feel like it was. It was literally the last episode that they actually bothered to fully animate an entire exchange. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. Yeah. I know exactly which match you're talking about. It's like an overhead shot of the table and just them like volleying forth, the yeah. ball back and forth. Yeah. And that's really every other time. It is very, um, you know manga yeah ish right like it is and i, I want to i want to spend some time on that and i forgot where we were so we're just going to loop back around whatever fine um i want to spend some time on that because i have been very critical of anime in the past about like how obsessed with still image it is like a lot of times i feel like in most of the anime we watch is is um an adaptation of a manga and so it, it cut trying to kind of tries to capture that still image quality um, or it's just it's very cheaply produced and therefore it just can't afford to animate very much. Um, I, I think the reason why I liked the style here um, just like basically it's very stylized and, and I appreciate the what it was doing, but it, it very much embraced the source material. Like it, it, not only is it a lot of still images, it is basically almost every frame looks like a comic book page. Like it is constantly like framing and and cutting in with new images. Um, It's very dynamic. Like there's a lot of still images being thrown on the screen, um, but they're intersecting each other and slicing into the frame and, and moving out. And like, it's just, it's still, but dynamic. If, if that makes sense. Well, this is, I think maybe the only time I've ever seen it work where you do the thing where, you split the visual animation panel with, with you know, with, with literal comic panels, um, yeah. and I know why too. I know why it worked for me here, and in many other cases it hasn't. And it's because every time they split and add a panel, now you're only seeing movement in one of the sub panels, and then maybe they'll mm-hmm. split it again and 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 then add a new sub panel, and then, and now you're still only seeing movement in one of the panels, and then all of the sure. all the surrounding panels are still image which which is still in your visual field and is still giving you information about like usually there's some relevance to what's to what remains in the in the panels um but the one that's moving is the one where your attention is focused and that and, and that's the only way you can do that I've, I've seen people try to split the panel and have animation in both panels and your brain can't look at two different moving objects at the same time it doesn't work um so, mm-hmm. so i thought this was this was pretty cool and it worked every time and i I really enjoyed the animation style. Um, I, I even enjoyed like sometimes it would take this just like aggressively low fi like just just like aggressively bad drawing. You know what I mean? Like like yeah, yeah. like that's just not that that's like I, I could literally draw that well, and and and, and they're doing it on <laughs> purpose clearly. Sure. Um, um, t- to make some kind of point about like it's a hazy memory maybe, so that's why they're doing it, or 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 like it's a it's a drawing of like characters you're not supposed to know so it doesn't matter who they are so we're not going to bother drawing their faces they're just going to get like a head blob um yeah, yeah. and all of that was fine i thought that was i thought that was a cool touch actually yeah and one of my frequent complaints with this kind of stuff is that it because it's so still it, it becomes very flat to me like it i i, I uh, scenes in a lot of the animes i've watched and I, I know i'm repeating myself from other stuff but i think it's important it comes off as very flat and uninteresting to me and no matter how still the image was, I thought this was always like it always had pace to it. It always had rhythm. Like I think the the idea of doing exactly what you're doing where they're slowly carving up the screen and only a little bit of the frame is moving at each time. I think it works well naturally with ping pong, which is a very rhythmic game where like one person is moving then the other person is moving uh-huh. then the other person is moving. And, and so just to take this idea of this, this back and forth volleying a ping pong and put it into your frame where slice up this side of the frame when one person swings, then that freezes slice up this part of the frame when the other person swings. And then let's do a quick, slice to uh, someone in the audience watching and smirking at someone to the thing. And then we can we give some visual information there while giving some exposition. Um, and, and, and it just, it just works. It has a rhythm to it as a pace to it. it. It felt like, like, even though, as you said, very rarely, except for that one time at the end, we're not actually watching pinging and ponging. Um, we feel the, the intensity and the, the rhythm of the match through this animation style yeah I, I, it worked very well yeah like i mean 
perhaps it sounded like a complaint that I was saying that there were so many characters, so many main characters. Um, but I think that ultimately it works really well that there are so many main characters because that means that by the time you get to the final two or three episodes, you're, you now know all these characters that are going into the finals really well. And mm-hmm. you can really drill down into their games. And not only that, but you can do this thing where you're cutting between their games and the reactions of the other characters that you know and care about and getting context on what's going on with them and how they're reacting to it. And it becomes this really fun melange of many, many people's reactions to everything that's happening. And, and it very fast paced, like, I mean, basically, like you said, it's, it's, still images but it's cutting between still images so frequently that your brain is still processing a lot of visual information um yeah which i think means that even if it's static you can't you don't get bored with it at all yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm glad peko had that star on his shirt that's what (laughs) i I, thank god for that (laughs) yeah um yeah i just i I really enjoyed this i i I want to talk about this like small moment at the end when the uh the coach um is is like really excited because i I couldn't i didn't actually catch what he said did he say that smile is coming over or did he say someone else is coming over anyway i I thought that was a great moment you mean in the the flash forward forward, scene uh yeah i thought thought it was i thought thought he said smile but but i yeah anyway this is the name's wrong, but like he was like so excited about it and it, it like it yeah. didn't even show smile come over. It just showed how excited he was. And I thought that was a great like, oh, they're friends. <laughs> I love I, I right. love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I loved that whole I love the choice to end on that. I mean, if you look at it, like. Only one of our big four still played ping yeah. pong, right? Um, it was only Peko who has gone on to to become a professional ping pong player. And I really like that because like this is, you know, it, it it's high school. These kids are playing high school sports. And that's, I think, something a lot of high school sports shows tackle is this idea that this is not going to be your whole life. Like very few of you are going to be good enough to go on and do anything with this in the future. Um, even, even smile. And some of you aren't going to even want to, some of you are going to realize that you don't want to do it. And I, and I like that we get to jump forward into the future and see that really, I mean, some of the best players like, like dragon was not only like considered the best player in Kyo and, and one of the best players in the world, but he was like the marketable superstar that had his own shoes that shoes for the mats. You got to have them. Um, I did learn like a lot of the, the politics of ping yeah. pong, if not the whole, the understanding of the game, but, um, he's done. He's got kicked off the national team. He's done. And he's got to find what life means now. And I just like, I, I, I think that's a really interesting thing to explore in the world of sports stories that especially, especially high school, because yeah, it's just, it's reality. Yeah. And you have so many people who ha- have decided as, teenagers that they're going to commit their entire lives to this thing and very few of them are going to get that paid off in any in any real way so we we jump forward i don't know how far in the future we're supposed to be 10 years maybe i don't know um but they all have found something that makes them happy yeah yeah and i think it's great yeah it does seem like it's probably about 10 years um and I, and I like that the older generation was featured in the story in the background the the the, the coach of uh, of you know the school team and the 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 smoking lady, the smoking I, forget lady. Her name. I, I forget everyone's name but yeah like like they, they, at first they're in the background and then gradually they too come into your mind as like oh these are also actual characters with actual backstories yeah. and act, like like actual feelings about what's going on like the 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 smoking lady had all kinds of emotions about um about Peiko injuring his knee and um, and, and I definitely, you know, I, I thought that was, I thought that was well conveyed, even though she's like not a very emotive character. I thought that the, um, yeah. the script, I guess you'd say, uh, really, really sold like that. She was actually really concerned about this, even though she has this affect of being very detached. Mm-hmm. Um, cause, cause like they, they were representing and, and even injecting into the, the dialogue, like, you know, you're going to have to kind of, you know, say like, for example, saying to smile, like you, you you're gonna have to live with your decisions like like the the way you choose to play these games 
is kind of who you are and you're going to have to live with those decisions yeah. going forward. And like, like, look at me, like I, I made certain decisions when I was exactly your age and I'm still kind of, um, living in the fallout of those decisions. And mm -hmm. I think that really grounded it and kind of elevated it, made it, um, made it more serious and like made it something you can take seriously instead of like a frivolous, I kind of a, yeah, just like a, I guess a, a frivolous sports show like because I, I, th I think of yeah there's obviously a lot of drama to be mined out of sports but it's it's easy to make a a mighty ducks where it's it's kind of just just the tropes and nothing deeper and, and i think this <laughs> did go a bit deeper didn't think we we're gonna do any mighty ducks dragging <laughs> today but here we are you know i haven't yeah no yeah. I, I know what you yeah, mean though i haven't seen mighty um, ducks since i was literally a kid so maybe it's brilliant it's, i don't know it's it's not it's fine it's absolutely fine um yeah i mean i, I think I think there is I appreciate, you know, between this and, and and Mob Psycho, the last anime we talked about, I, I appreciate these animes that are willing to go smaller um, and, and Mob Psycho ramps up pretty significantly by the end. But like the stakes of this are high because they're important to the characters. Um, but th there is no like I, I was so afraid, especially in in the parts where like you cut to like the the magical ping pong planet man and i was like we're not really going to do this right <laughs> and in like it, any other any other style of show i would i would have immediately like grokked to the metaphor but in anime in the back of my head i was like we're not going to like really do like a ping pong planet thing are we and i think i think you would agree that that would it very possibly could have been a thing that this anime would have actually I, done. I, yeah, um, I mean, because they kept showing like the locker and the ping pong planet guy, and I was like, so is he, like, is he going to become possessed by the spirit of some kind of ping pong, like <laughs> exactly, like God or something? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I thank God, thank God we didn't go. I mean, w like, there's a lot of anime nonsense in this this show because it's anime, but it didn't go full anime nonsense. Like I, I compare this to like a code Geass and I'm like, guys, it's just about ping pong. It's just some, some dudes playing ping pong and some of them are really good at it. And some of them are naturally good at it. And they have to learn about the difference between talent and hard work. Um, and, and, and deal with that. Even if you're super talented, you still got to work really hard. And then, you know, with, uh, with a demon Sakuma, uh, learned that sometimes hard work isn't yeah. enough. Some, I mean, th there's truly, you know, I, we want to live in a world where you work hard at something as hard as you can and you'll be one of the best, but there's, it's not going to, it's not true. And, and we deal with that through this character who like is on one of the best teams in the world beats Peko kind of sends him on his journey um, cause he beats him. They were childhood friends and he actually managed to beat him in the first tournament. And so he sends him on his discovery and then realizes very quickly that it doesn't matter how hard I train. I'm never going to be as, I'm never going to be the elite, the top. Um, and that's, I think that's an important lesson yeah. too. Like that's, that's a thing that people need to learn that like, there's going to be times in your life where you're just not going to be like, there are people better than you at everything yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's almost like they had a list of like, hard hard kind of meaningful lessons to be learned from from young people playing sports and they they managed to get all of them in i mean i think that may be why it feels overstuffed like there's there's a couple of side characters who you probably could have cut them from the show and not really lost much not that i'm saying i didn't enjoy them um so like one of them is and i'm sorry i don't have her name in front of me and i don't remember her name because i don't remember any of the names but the the girl who was in the orbit of dragon and was sort of had a crush on him and he was like i believe her name was your okay um yeah and and like the way the way uh, honestly the way i thought that was gonna go is like he was gonna learn e either he was going to see that he had been ignoring her and she was there the whole time or or that other character who liked her was going to attract her attention they were gonna have a romance but really it was it, her whole story was just her it was about her it was not about the ping pong players it was about her realizing yeah. like i need to stop waiting around for this dude to pay attention to me he's not he's not going yeah. to i need to go have my own life and do my own thing and have my own adventures and she does and that's it 
she she just leaves. Sure. And that's great. Uh, I, th- I thought that was I thought that was cool and, and refreshing, and I was like, oh, that surprised me. And, and then, you know, there's the other side character who, who's almost a comic character. I think he is a uh, you know a, a comic character, but with a bit of bittersweetness to him. Where it's the guy who um, is it Peiko who who just completely uh, skunks him, <laughs> uh, skunks yeah. him in the first game, and he like literally like uh, flees and travels the whole world <laughs> trying trying to yeah. find something. And, and then and then comes back and realizes that Peiko is the best player and, and he was wrong to feel so worthless about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was a funny and 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 uh, but also, you know, also like not not just funny. Right. I mean, am, am I wrong? I thought I thought that was a fun character. No. Yeah. I mean, he's very minor. And, and there were a couple of times when especially when he showed up in the last episode, I was like, wait, who <laughs> who's this? Who's this? Yeah. But. I, I got there eventually. Yeah. Um, so there was also, so demon shows up in the very last episode with like crazy fifties hair. Um, like he's got Fawn's hair going on right. or something and he's got this woman with him. And like, she is the stereotypical, like annoying harpy woman character that I hate. Like I hate. And, and I was like, thank God it was only for like five minutes, but do you, do you know who I'm talking about? Like, she's just like yelling at him. He shows up at the final tournament. He's like, what are we doing here? Where are we? And I was just like, why did you bring, I hate this. I hate this so much. I, um, was she the same one who Peiko had gone on a date with earlier? See, I, this is maybe, I yeah, don't know. Th- and and I, I don't know either. I, I literally, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think I was. See, I guess, I guess it was just nails on a chalkboard for me. So I was like, I just I, like this is it's a, the same type of character that I feel like appears in anime a lot, um, and I just can't stand that that archetype at all. And thank God it was just really brief. Like, probably doesn't even slot into the archetype. But just like we see her, and she's just like whining to uh, demon like the whole time. Yeah, and then she's gone real quick. Yeah, I, I guess. Um it didn't register on my consciousness in any serious way. Um, but I can see, I can see how that fair, would annoy you fair. there. Yeah. Um, cool. That I, I, I liked it a lot. Um, I almost want to watch it again. Almost. It was, it's very long. <laughs> I do not. The, watch the reason I say that is kind of what I just said about the idea that if you start off with the, with the, with the feeling that like, Oh, these, this is such a tropey anime. We're just, we're just going to be seeing all these all these tropes. I I already know who all these characters are because I've seen them a million times. Um, you're actually missing a lot if you if you go into the show believing yeah. that. And I feel like I did miss a lot. And if I started over and maybe watch the first like three episodes, knowing where the show is going, I would appreciate a lot more of the subtlety of what the show is actually doing toward the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that's it's it's where my main criticism lies with this whole thing that, you know, we've talked, we've had a lot of very good things to say. And I, I, I genuinely think this is fairly good. I think the beat to beat storytelling, like the actual, like on the ground telling of the story can be very, very clunky um, to the point where like it is, it is, it does take you a bit to, to catch on to what's going on and to follow what it's doing. And like, it just kind of throws you from thing to thing. Like it's, it's, it's a very like slow burn of a show, but like when it does speed up and something happens, like I was, I was confused throughout a lot of it. Sometimes I was like, wait, who, and we're doing what now? And like, what, wait, what, Uh (laughs) you know, like, I think, I think just like, there's a lot of moments where just like the, 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 and therefore, but yeah. then just moment to moment beats just didn't didn't work as smoothly for sure. me. And it made it it made it more challenging. I think it made it like I think the reason you want to watch it again is because once you have the overall shape of the the story in your head, it is much easier to follow. Yeah. Um, and and I'm not saying this is a complicated story. It's not. But and I think that's I think that's that's why I think this is a problem is because it's not a complicated story. And yet um, I always felt like I was trying to catch. Well, up. Yeah. So so it is and it isn't right, because he, here's here's the structure of the story for essentially all of the characters. Um, first tournament and surrounding events. 
reacting yeah. to first tournament and surrounding events, second tournament and surrounding events. Right, right. And the fact that there's so many characters means that every single character has like 50 little bullet points that are kind of interspersed throughout each of those sections. So there's a ton going on actually with, with a ton of different characters. And, and I agree completely that some of those moments you're just like, I don't actually know what I'm supposed to be feeling right now. Um, am I supposed to like this character? Am I supposed to feel bad for them about what's happening? I, 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 I don't necessarily not feel bad for them so much as I'm confused about what the what the intended tone is with this particular moment. And mm-hmm. um, I think that that maybe is just simply because they were trying to do so much. Like like you're cutting between yeah, yeah. you're cutting between so many different like you're cutting between different characters who are doing different things, who are having different conversations. Sometimes you just can't change gears that quickly and um you know, or, or or rather, you know, the show tries to change gears in a way where you're just like, no, no, I'm still thinking about the last thing, you know? Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think so. And, and I think, I think it's, you know, especially with the number of side characters, like, like the first time we met dragon, I didn't know he was going to be an important right. character. Like, I was just like, here's this bald man and he's coming here to look at these characters. And meanwhile, I'm like, OK, so there's the antler hair guy. He's probably going to be important. Right. Nah, not really. It turns out. Um, but so, so then when we get to the tournament and I see bald guy again with his whole team, I'm kind of like, wait, who are those? Right. He, is he a player? First of all, he also looks like 30. And actually, the the show makes yeah. a joke about that. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like a huge <laughs> muscular man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that they made a joke. It made me feel better about being like, wait, he's supposed to be in high school. He, he looks like 40. But um, I, that that hurt with the confusion, uh-huh. my confusion yeah. as well. Um, and I think, you know, one of, one of the things I just think the brain does when you're throwing this many characters at you kind of like your brain just like shortcuts to who is who. Like you just attach something uh-huh. that's basic to the understanding of which character is which. Um, and I think with a lot of the characters in the show looking fairly similar, it, it was very difficult to do that at times. Um, it, it took a while. It, like I said, it took a while for me to, to break down uh, bald guy, bald guy with glasses, bald guy right. with eyebrows and which, which, what is the relationship between each of those ones and relationships between the eight other characters? And it just, it just, it's, it's a little bit, it takes a little time to process this stuff in, in storytelling, I guess. Um, and meanwhile, the story is going on. And so you, you've just missed stuff. And I mean, I mean, I'm, I fully will admit that maybe that's just, I was just bad at watching the show. Uh, uh, and if so, I'll take that. But I don't know. I, I watch a lot of television. I watch a lot of movies and, and I, I don't have this problem as much. So my response is to say, yeah, hmm, I wonder if there's something wrong with just how they the, the beat to beat. Uh, I, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, that's that's why I think I'm interested in talking about that, because I want to understand what why exactly and and where exactly it went wrong because i think it's got so much about it that's strong that i want to understand where it doesn't quite work like like for me i mean Mm -hmm. um you know we're we're talking about dragon kazuma right now and i still couldn't tell you what the outline of his backstory is i know that it has something to do with either a father or a grandfather um, Both. like, like Both. someone died and then someone was a failure and then someone was really abusive and demanding. I don't know who fills those roles exactly, but basically, basically he ended up feeling like he needed to like p- play really hard to earn back some, s- s- something. Yes. And, and like, I'm really not, it, 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 it needs to be better. Uh, better dramatized and more clarified than that for me to really hook into him as a character. Yeah, I felt like he was by far the biggest failure of, of a character in terms of making me care about what was going on with him. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is I think this is just kind of economy of storytelling or just the amount of time you have to tell stories because like I, I totally agree with you. And I was just sitting here thinking like, I know I watched every single minute right. of the story and I was just like, okay, wh- when did we, I, I definitely remember 
he was climbing a mountain and the bird keeps flying higher than a mountain. And I loved yeah. that symbolism. I thought that was really wonderful. It's like the harder you try to climb, uh, the, a per, another person will just easily be able to fly higher. That's beautiful. Loved it. Um, but yeah, like the actual meat of that. And, and I think one of the things we saw where I think the show does it really well with smile and with Pecco is we flash back to their childhood multiple times throughout the show. So, we don't get their whole backstory that is that is reserved for us till the very end of the show but we've anchored the audience in these flashback moments so they they mean a little bit more and when you flash back to it your brain can be like okay we're back here again it's going to something to do with they were kids like we saw we see smile in the the locker multiple times before we learn like what's going on there i mean you you make assumptions right because it's got the 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 mop the broom handle covering the thing so he's presumably locked in there um but you don't you don't see like you don't see the extent of the bullying and and what peko's role and to in, in helping him from that was until later in the series but that that beat has been established for you whereas i think a character like dragon he's so mysterious and so uh just the guy who's really obsessed with ping pong for so long that it's not anchored in anything until the very end. And, and so it's hard to keep up with it when you have this many characters that are doing this many different things. Um, and I, and I like, I get it. Like you don't have time to do that with every single one of your characters, but I think that goes back to what you're talking about, about just like, sometimes I think this tried to bite off more than it could chew. Yeah. Like it's almost like it either should have taken its time or it should have cut out some characters, mm -hmm. yeah. but, but as it is, this is a lot of characters to try to fit into something, which, as I said, is basically a long movie. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, especially, like, yeah, it, it just, frankly, I just didn't care about Dragon that much. Like, I, I followed, like you said, the, the imagery of the bird and the, and the guy climbing the mountain. That actually clarified what was going on with him much more than him staring at a toilet ever did. Um, <laughs> right, right, And then right. once I got that, I was like, okay, I get I no Siri that's fine don't worry about it um <laughs> yeah yeah well once I got that I was like yeah I get it like it's I'm not um I'm not lost anymore but I still don't care but but all the all the other I mean, main characters I I was really into their story and really excited to see how it would resolve well it's interesting because and maybe I'm just misremembering but like with Kong we immediately got that airplane imagery yeah and that continued throughout his entire story that that beat I think that the climbing the mountain and the bird thing would have been a perfect thing to to grasp onto with Dragon early mm -hmm. and continue throughout the story. And I don't think we did that. I think that's a late revelation, like after he literally is telling the story about when he was a kid and climbing the mountain with his father. <laughs> um, I, I like that's a perfect like they do such a good job at, at taking symbols and applying them to different characters. Um, and that's one where. You should have just done that. Yeah. And instead we get the recurring beat of the dragon, right? Which just was not, didn't really have anything to do with him besides that was his nickname. Yeah, that didn't connect. It's a good yeah. point. Yeah. You, you, you get that he's driven. You don't get why he's driven. I'm still not entirely sure why he's driven, but with, with, just gotta, with just, Kong, absolutely get why he's driven. He, mm -hmm. he has his, you know, his reputation and he wants to get back to his mom and all this complicated yeah. stuff that you really feel for him. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's funny that we, I don't know, I, I don't like to dwell on the negative, but the, the thing is I, I liked so much about so many of the characters where I'm like, why didn't you do that for this character? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. And, and I think the answer is I didn't have time to do yeah. that. This is a lot of drawings I have to draw. <laughs> yeah. It's a terrible strain on the artist's wrist. Um, <laughs> uh, what else do you want to talk about on this? I'm trying to think of an, if there's anything else to talk about, uh, you know, I, I did like I I was so it is exactly what it's billed as it's ping pong the end yeah. <laughs> like it is it is exactly that it is nothing more it is nothing less um and and I appreciated it for that and um I I, I want to go back and watch Friday Night Lights because it's such a good show I like some of the moments where like it was in one of the latter the last two episodes where. I don't even remember who it is exactly, but I just, I think, yeah, I don't remember who it is, but it's like they set the ball spinning and then they like let it like climb over their hand and over the racket, like over and over and over. And like, it just goes like, it's a shot. It's like a shot that goes way longer than it needs to, but you don't mind mm -hmm. because it's, 
it's just really cool and mesmerizing. Yeah, there were there were a few shots yeah. like that. Um, I I thought of one while I was watching, and I I said, Scott, write this down, and I was like, oh, I'll remember it, and then I did. Yeah. So hooray um, me. Um, other stuff to talk about. I thought it was pretty funny when it wanted to be. Um, like like mm-hmm. I I yeah. thought that the humor was successful for me. I, I I mean I bring that up because I think we both complained about um attempt attempted humor in anime not really working on us possibly for cultural reasons who knows but <sighs> yeah but I, yeah, but I yeah. felt like um I I got I got all of the jokes and thought they were funny. Mm-hmm. I loved when they went into the place and there were mats everywhere. Yeah, and they're like mats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the one guy slips on the mat and it's like, oh, it's so slippery. Yeah. It's like you fall down everywhere. <laughs> right. Well, I I mean, I don't know if this is a joke per se, but I like that they um uh uh basically the team, I, I forget all the, the team names, but the, the team that was basically their 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 whole thing is they're selling the shoes. Um and the one guy on that team is like, I don't need shoes, who cares? Yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, yeah, it's good stuff. It is good stuff. Um, and uh, the one thing I knew about ping pong going into the show is that the Chinese are very, very good at it. Uh-huh. They're like normally, I think the gold medal winners in the Olympics normally. Um, so I think it was interesting to see this, uh, see a ping pong story from the Japanese perspective. Um, and then as soon as the Chinese character is brought into it you're like oh here's he's gonna be the best one and he wasn't at all like that i still i still am so surprised by where kong's story went because i really i really thought especially after he loses the first time it's like well he's gonna be like in the finals like and he doesn't make it he doesn't make no, it there. no it, his arc which again I, I love is at first coming in with this terrible terrible attitude toward the people who have hired him to come be a coach like he's he's just paying lip service and he really just wants to win the tournament and get the hell out and of get there. the hell out yeah. of there and and he has a terrible attitude towards his teammates and then his arc is basically becoming their devoted coach who really cares about them and they're his priority yeah yeah so it doesn't even matter if he wins anymore yep. and he he loses like a champ yep. it's great it's great well uh anything else i think that's it I think that's ping pong. That's ping pong. We got it. We nailed do you, it down. Do you at all want to go play ping pong? I'm so. Uh, you know what? I just realized something, Scott. I was about to say. I was about to say. I'm so bad at ping pong. I just and then I realized that I don't wear glasses anymore. So maybe I'm not bad at ping pong anymore. Oh. Uh, do you remember in in college, when Michael and I would play table tennis I, all the time? I do, because Michael would. I, I mean, I think I might even have played with you guys a few times and I was just so bad yeah. that you were just like, just, uh, just, uh, why don't you go get us some water, Matt? Um, <laughs> not, not really, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, Michael's one of those Pecos where he's just like, just naturally good at so many things. And like, we started at about the same level and he just advanced faster than me in every conceivable way. <laughs> yeah. Michael. <laughs> to where I was just no longer winning games. Michael is that character you're right that is super annoying yeah (laughs) Yeah. absolutely it's it's and and he always wants people to play games against him but it's pointless because he'll just win anyway yep yep damn soul caliber i have nightmares (laughs) about soul caliber 2 should we should we tell that story which one the 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 time like where it was basically just like uh the entire floor of our dorm was playing a, like just Soul Caliber for like hours and hours, and it was like whoever loses rotates out to the next person in line, and yeah, Michael just yeah. played the, played for four, for four hours because never lost, never lost ever. anyone, yeah. just beat everyone over and over and over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, and we were like, we were, I mean, we were writing di- like stories as we were doing it. Like this is it. This is my redemption arc, and it didn't matter. None of it mattered. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Michael. All right, well that's ping pong. <laughs> okay, Matt, uh I want there was a couple things I wanted to talk to you about before we go. The first one um is we have to talk about the Star Wars trailer cuz the trailer for Rise of is it Rise of the Skywalker or The Rise it, of Skywalker? It's Rise. The, I Oh my god, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're bad at this. No, I think it's Oh my God! You, you see, if you hadn't said anything, 
The it rise is the of rise Skywalker. of Skywalker. Yes. Yes. So the trailer for the rise of Skywalker came out on uh, Monday. Um, they called this the final trailer, even though it is also the first one, because everything up until then was a teaser. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts. What do you think about this trailer? I, I don't know if I have a ton of thoughts about it. I, I felt like they showed too much just a little bit. Like there, there are a couple scenes in there where I'm Interesting. like, there was a couple, a couple scenes. I mean, I don't even, I mean, I don't want to spoil, I guess, but like there were a couple of scenes where I was like, well, that, that tells me more information than I wanted to know going into it. And maybe I'm misinterpreting what I'm seeing, obviously, but like certain i feel like in a trailer for a movie like this i i i want to i want to be enticed by the idea that there's going to be fun adventure and stuff but i don't necessarily want to see like oh these two characters definitely have this particular kind of interaction that i yeah. uh, you know what i mean so um yeah i i know what you mean i don't know if i agree i mean i i, I think i actually think the trailer did a very good job of showing us a lot without telling us anything mm-hmm. like i have no idea what the structure of this movie is that's fair yeah, I like, I agree. Like presumably they're gonna be looking for something. They gotta go see the emperor or something. Or, or, or something, right? And, and they, like there's a lot of cool looking Star Wars the adventure looking stuff, which which is what makes it um sound fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea how this movie's gonna turn out. I think they cut a very good trailer. I mean, I think one of the things that I appreciate the most of the trailer is the way it really sells you on the this is it of it all. Um, and, and of course, we know it's not true. Like, there's going to be Star Wars movies until we die and then some. <laughs> yeah. But th- they're billing this as the end of the Skywalker saga, which is the nine films of this this story. Um, and so it, it is supposed to have a climactic end to it. And I think the trailer sells that climactic end. I don't know if the movie will, because I, as much as I enjoy the last Jedi, I think one thing that is absolutely true about this new trilogy is the overarching storyline is not very clear. Like the, the, like the, the goal, like if you look at the original trilogy, like it was going to end with the empire falling. Yeah. Like, and you could probably, you could have probably predicted that, like from the first five minutes of the second movie. Um, I mean, the the prequel trilogy is literally the reverse of that. And this, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think that you could build a case that um, Force Awakens was very much uh, honoring the past. And then The Last Jedi is the transition. And this movie will be about staking a new future. Um, and I like that narrative. I don't know what that looks like in this movie, especially since it's a movie that is also going to be clearly so reverential to the past. They're going back to Endor, um, the the emperor, uh, to, I don't know. Kylo Ren is definitely going to get redeemed because it wouldn't be a star Wars story without redemption. Right. I think I said the other day, I would really like it if they made the theme of this movie dealing with the mess left to you by your predecessors. (laughs) <laughs> because that would work work really well metatextually. Sure, sure. Uh, because, like, again, I, I enjoy a lot about The Last Jedi. I, I think it's brilliant at what it's doing, but it's also kind of throwing a wrench into the gears in terms of trying to make a coherent and satisfying adventure trilogy. Like, it's, it, Yeah, I mean, I, it, I, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I, I don't, like, I, I think there's this narrative out there that, like, Ryan Johnson specifically set out to to toss everything J.J. Abrams did out the window. I, I don't think that's true. I, I think the main problem with that is The Force Awakens failed to set anything up sufficiently. So The Last Jedi was going off it in the way it could. Because like I think one thing this trilogy absolutely has failed to do is make us understand the world. I still don't understand who the First Order is. I don't understand the power dynamic in the galaxy it doesn't right. make sense because well, yeah, they never established like, it where are their shipyards like where did they come from we don't know any of this and and, yeah, and the fact why, is why were they allowed to become like what what was what was the, the world doing <laughs> yeah i mean so i i feel like a like a heel asking the question where are the first order shipyards because the fact is i never want i never needed to ask where where is the empire shipyards because it was clear that the empire controlled everything right right but you don't you have no idea what 
what and where and why and how or in any information about yeah. the first order. So Well, and it's because it's because The Force Awakens was so obsessed with recreating what happened before that they tried to have their cake and eat it too. Like they needed it needed to be a sequel so the Republic had to exist again because they won at the end of the last one. Yeah. But they wanted the Empire still. So they created the Empire again and and then never bothered to connect those dots in a satisfactory way. Yeah. Like I think if you read about the story, you learn that like the Republic for for decades was all about like appeasement and was like they knew that the remnants of the empire were out there building strength, but they didn't want to do anything about it because they didn't want to have a standing military because that's that, too many bad memories with that. Um, but eventually they like needed someone to do something. So they authorized like secretly authorized Leia to form a resistance to the first order that was like sanctioned by the government, but not formally. And like, look, everything I just said sounds boring as shit. And I don't want that in a, the movie, but you need to like, you need to set it up somehow. If, if it's something that you know is going to be a question in the audience's mind, then you need to answer it or you need to make it so that it doesn't matter. Yeah. And they didn't do either of those things. Sure. sure. So, and so, and, and yeah. so the, the big question is how does, is this movie going to try to rect- retroactively do those things or is it just going to plow into it doesn't matter because there's a whole lot of death stars in this movie matt like the trailer there's a whole bunch of them i do wonder you know so like it's it's i'm entirely incapable of having an objective take on the original trilogy um for obvious reasons because i grew up with it um (laughs) but but it is interesting to think about the transition from empire to return of the jedi where um i'm sure that was not what people expected it's sure. just like you go from like Luke gets his hand cut off and he's and then bam, we have Luke. He's all dressed in black. Several years have passed. He now has a creepy green lightsaber. He's force choking people. Um, what happened? What the hell happened to Luke Skywalker? This isn't my Luke Skywalker. Um, and and I do wonder like if they're going to take the opportunity to 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 let some time pass or yeah. or if this is just going to be like the next day, you know, practically speaking. I hope, I hope there's a jump. I really do. I hope there's a jump. I hope we see characters like, cause I mean, the last Jedi ends with like the resistance is dead. There's like 12 people. Yeah. That's it. And obviously by the end of that movie, we saw a whole bunch of resistance ships behind the millennium Falcon. So there's going to be a bunch of people again. Like I would love to see them in the middle of like struggling to survive. Just, running through the galaxy with just a handful of them or like they've hidden out on a planet for a couple of years, like gone into exile as they're attempting to build strength Ray's probably off training or something. I hope there's a jump there. I hope we do. I hope that I hope it starts and knowing JJ Abrams, I think it is going to start on a beat that makes us remember the last or return of the Jedi. I, I really do. I think we're going to see a Ray walk a, a differently dressed Ray walk somewhere and do something. And we're going to have that Skywalker beat where I'm like, Oh, huh. Uh-huh. What happened to her? Yeah. I mean, we almost know that from the trailer with the, <laughs> um, cer- certain things. Sure. Um, sure. Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I am cautiously optimistic. I do. I do think one thing JJ Abrams is not good at is finishing things. And because this has to be the end of not only this trilogy, but now they've, they've built this narrative that this has to be the end of the, the, the the star wars like the, the, like quote unquote uh-huh. like that's that's a lot that's a lot that's a lot you have to do there um and yeah i, I, I don't know i guess you know speaking about like optimism my current kind of the way my brain works i think i've talked about this before and it's silly and it's self-indulgent to talk about in, in, in a sense but i think everybody has their own kind of relationship with canon like the concept of how canon works sure and so like for me the original trilogy is its own thing. The prequels didn't happen. <laughs> and I don't really think this new trilogy happened either. But if this last movie is really, really good, then maybe this last trilogy did happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the the one thing that remains positively 100% true to me is I think I like all these new characters a lot. I like... Poe 
I like Finn. I like Ray. I love Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren is unquestionably the most complex Star Wars character in the main series. Like, yeah, that's that's a very low bar, <laughs> but I, yeah. I think he's a fascinating character. And I know we're going to do like he's going to be Ben Solo by the end of this movie. There's just there's no way like I, I, I find it very hard to believe that they will not do the redemption arc. But what does that look like in this movie? What is what is a redemption arc for a character like that look like in 2019? I'm interested to see that. And and I want to be positive and I want to like I'm so like it's so easy to be snarky about Star Wars is the thing. It, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I was that person for so long. I was so snarky about Star Wars because it's so easy to do. And I just don't know if I want to be that person anymore. So I'm just looking at this and saying like, all right, if it's good, like fucking a, that's great. I'm so happy if it's bad. Okay. I'm just what uh, that's fine. That's fine. Um, one of the things I was talking to you about is that I, I there's someone I was following on Twitter, um, that was rewatching all the movies with their son, their six year old son and kind of live tweeting their son's reaction and their son's favorite movie was the force awakens out of all the star Wars movies that they watched. He liked the force awakens the most. And, and and it just just makes me think like as, as cynical and as snarky as I can get about these movies, the kids fucking love them. Like there's laser swords and ships flying around and, and action and excitement and adventure. And like, I don't know, like I think you're absolutely right that we cannot look at star Wars, the original trilogy trilogy objectively. I can, I can turn my, analysis brain on and and analyze the first star wars movie and say this is like perfect structuring and pacing but i don't know if like if i had seen this movie as a 30 year old dude if i would feel as wonderful about it as as a six-year-old kid watching the force awakens for the first time feels i mean and the fact is i i'm pretty sure you wouldn't like like i i've i've shown my kids the star wars movies and i've shown them a whole bunch of marvel movies Star Wars movies are pretty slow and boring compared to Marvel movies. <laughs> it's just a different type of storytelling. It's a telling, different type right? of storytelling. It's, I mean, I'm not like the, the effects are not even on the same page for one thing, but but also sure, sure. Um, the the storytelling, like like the, the the you know, A New Hope is a very the beginning of that movie is this very slow, like atmospheric kind of. I don't know if atmospheric is the right word, but like it's all about yeah. the setting. It's all about this weird. You know, it, it, it's um, it's a weird movie actually. A, a New Hope is a weird movie. <laughs> well, I think I think uh, The Empire Strikes Back is a is a quote unquote weird movie. Yeah. I mean, I, if you look at the structure of that movie, it's got a very bombastic, action packed opening. It's got a big set piece ending, and then in the middle is just a lot of characters kind of just moving around, yeah. like like. The, the Millennium Falcon section of the second act of Empire Strikes Back is them just hiding again and again and right. again and again. And and Luke is just his stuff with with Yoda. And look, I'm not criticizing that. I think it's a fantastic movie. But yeah, it is. It is. It, we don't make movies like that anymore. And so I think kids are used to a certain speed and pace nowadays. And you can comment and critique on whether that's good or not i don't care whatever but i I do think these movies play very well for small children i I really do and that is exciting and and i think at the end of the day that is what they should do that is to me hearing that a six-year-old kid like loves the force awakens i'm like yes absolutely great that is the movie succeeded great as much as i don't like it you know sure Uh, yeah absolutely i mean I, i think um I, I don't know. I, I don't see any reason how to say it. Like I, I, I like the Marvel movies, you know, I do. And sure. sure. Um, and I wanted to loop back around to something you said earlier, or something we kind of were both talking about earlier, the idea that if this movie is really good, it could like, for me, retroactively save, not save, because it's not like I hated these movies or anything, but like retroactively elevate the other two. Sure. Um, cause like, cause in infinity war honestly did that for me. Um, I, I was, kind of lukewarm on on the mcu and 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 if you go back and listen to old podcasts i'll be pretty snarky about about a lot of the mcu movies and very oh, like yeah, uh, i remember our civil war episode you did not like that movie no i kind of still think it's not great but but i don't but i but i won't be so harsh harsh on it because i now i care a lot more about the characters 
because I thought Infinity War was so good, you know, mm-hmm. like, it, yeah. yeah. So, so I think one movie, and this is a new, this is kind of a new discovery for me, this idea that, that a movie in a, in a saga of movies can change your opinion about other movies in the saga. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It makes sense. Yeah. So that's a much longer than anticipated <laughs> talk about Star Wars. Um, yeah. I am sure we will be back with an episode reviewing that movie when it comes out. I've bought my tickets already because that's how Star Wars work. If you don't do that, you're not seeing it the opening weekend. Oh my God, really? When is it coming out? uh, The 19th of December. Oh, that's okay. (laughs) All right. Yeah, but the opening weekend tickets are probably already sold out. Oh my God. Okay. You might want to go check up on that. I'll go check up on that. Do, 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 do. All right. So speaking kind of of that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this article that came out today. Um, It's kind of getting into the business of film, which we like to talk about every once in a while. Um, It's an article written by Matt Zoller Seitz, who is a a film critic that I I really like. He wrote this for Vulture. And the title is Disney is quietly placing classic Fox movies into its vault. And that's worrying. Um, So for those of you that don't know, Disney bought Fox this past year is a multi-billion dollar transaction. It was enormous. And Disney now owns the entire 20th Century Fox and other like Fox Searchlight and all that other stuff. They own all their movies now. And um, one of the things that just to kind of set the the stage for this movie theaters, Matt, uh, don't don't do that well anymore. (laughs) They're suffering uh, because because the internet exists and streaming exists. And I think the average person goes to four movies a year and that's it. Um, maybe even less. So one of the things that movie theaters do to kind of pump their revenue up is they have what are called repertory screenings, which is basically old movies that they screen and people come and do them. If you live near an Alamo draft house, you've probably heard about their movie parties, which is just like, old movie screenings that they do with like props and like quote alongs and, and fun stuff to make it like, just have fun while watching the movie. But a lot of independently owned theaters do this with like, I mean, you think 20th century Fox is diehard. It's alien. Um, Hey, it's, um, it's what is the name of that? I can't remember. Uh, the Rocky horror picture show is a Fox movie and that is famous for rep screenings. Um, and so the the what this article is, has investigated is that Disney is kind of slowly taking these movies and not letting people show them anymore. Um, and it's an interesting dynamic in the in the changing landscape of theaters that I kind of wanted to talk to you about because Disney has kind of always done this with their movies. Like the Disney Vault was something that was invented by Disney to breed scarcity. Um, back in the days of home video, they would just stop producing VHS tapes of movies for no reason other than that makes them rare. And then they'd bring them out of the vault and then they could advertise, we're bringing Aladdin out of the vault and you could only buy Aladdin for two weeks until we run out. And then you can't see Aladdin anymore. Um, well, they're doing this with the Fox movies now. Yeah. I hate this a whole bunch. Scott. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've always been annoyed, but that they're so weird about their, um, about, about selling their movies. Like I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't show my, my kids. I haven't shown my kids the Disney movies that I grew up loving because they make it so onerous to find them and watch them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's super bad. Like, I don't, I think that's just a bad decision, honestly. Like they, they could have had my money and they didn't get it. Um, and, and yeah, this idea that first of all, it's hurting, it's hurting theaters, which, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see what it gains them in exchange for hurting the theaters. For one thing, uh, I guess, I guess one thing it gains them is it sort of funnels you toward their streaming services if they want you. Yep. You know, if if you want to, if you want to watch this content, you've got to go to their streaming services. But I just don't, I just don't see that it, like, the market of people going to these rep screenings was already pretty small, probably. So relatively, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems like kind of a a, a sad a sad thing to happen. Um, I don't like it. Yeah, I mean, and it's gonna like the the movie industry is so fucked up. Like it's so 
the the rules and the 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 gamesmanship around distribution distrib- distribution and exhibition I tried to say those words at the same time is already really weird. Like there's all these re- weird words around rules around like um, if there's a big multiplex and the article goes into this. If there's a big multiplex within like 10 miles of your indie theater, then the studio will just say, no, you're not getting the movie. Like even if it's a brand new movie, even if it's a brand new Disney movie, like if there's a big AMC and you're 10 miles away from the AMC, even though you're like a small independent theater, they can just say, sorry, it's going to that one, not you. Even if you wanted it, we're not we're not going to do that. And so it's already this weird thing where all these theaters have basically scraped a living out of showing these older movies. Like, I think one of the ones they talk about is the, is the last independent theater in Atlanta, which Atlanta is a huge town for there to be only one independent theater. There is insane. But they make 25 percent of their annual revenue off of Fox rep screenings. So that's huge. Yeah, that's crushing, we have yeah. that's we have to go out of business if if this goes away. And th- the good news for them is they said about half of that is Rocky Horror Picture Show and Rocky Horror Picture Show is the one thing that Disney has said or not even said, the one thing that that has been true that they are still allowing that one. Um and I think I think the article points this out and I think they're right that um if they pulled Rocky Horror Picture Show like people would go insane yeah and that would be such bad press that that they and that's and that's one thing that's weird about what they're doing here is the company has not come out with like a formal official statement about this and said here's our policy on all these old movies it they're just doing it like case by case basis where like someone will like if you want to show a rep screening you go to the company that that holds a movie and you send them a request and they charge you money to to get a copy of the film to show and suddenly these requests are being denied or um or the ones that were already granted are being like retroactively denied where someone from disney will just like reach out to someone and be like hey remember when we said you could see die hard never mind sorry that was our bad <laughs> yeah um and and so they're not being consistent with this and it's like it depends on the market like some markets uh, the one market said yes to alien um another Absolutely not. And it's like it's it's weird. It, I don't know what's going on here. And I think you're absolutely right that this has to do with with whatever they're planning with their streaming stuff. Yeah, this seems like some kind of high level corporate strategy um, that they're being told to do. And, yeah, you know, it's funny because normally I, I get annoyed. You know, I just think it's a cliche to name your article like such and such company is quietly doing something. Um, and I think that the, the, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, the title of this article is Disney is quietly putting all the Fox movies in the vault and it's like, that's <laughs> right. exactly, but, but, but like, this is one case where I'm like, yep, that's exactly accurate. Like they, they're doing this, they're being really shady about it. They're being really uncommunicative about it and, and it's hurting small businesses. And I guess that's, yeah, that's most of the reason why I don't like it. So hopefully mm-hmm. they stop this. And like, I, I just don't, I don't know. I'm I, like, uh, they're they're a giant business, and they're going to do whatever they want to do. But sure, I, sure. I, I I hope that if if people make a stink about it, then it'll <laughs> it'll give them a uh, it'll make them reconsider. Yeah, I, I um, I hope best case scenario for well, not best case, but I hope at least this article like gets and that's kind of the reason I'm talking about it because I want everyone listening to this to go read the article and share it because hopefully like this article brings up such a stink that they at least have to make a formal official statement clarifying what their policy is Um, because at least then we'd know right and that's the weird thing that's happening right now is uh, we don't know yeah I don't know yeah yeah I think this I think the the last thing I want to say about this I think this is like shows kind of a, a, a interesting problem that i think we're going to have going forward so like i don't know how many people know about this but there was a decision back uh, was it the i think it was the 50s the early 50s the late 40s basically back in the day when when movies first came out um if you were a production company you could also own movie theaters so like you were in charge of production and distribution and exhibition of all these movies so uh, you could Oh, you could say, OK, we're going to produce this movie and you you can only see it in a um, Warner Brothers theater. And that's we're, we're only going to distribute it and only exhibit it in those theaters. And the government said, 
no, you can't do that. And that was one of the big things, the big, one of the big breaks up breakups of the studio system was this rule that like, you can't do that anymore. Like you cannot control the entire line from creation to exhibition. Like you can't do that. That's not fair. And what's kind of happened now, Matt is they're doing that again. If Disney can now create something and put it on their streaming platform and their streaming platform only and it's it's basically the same thing, but at home. And I don't know, like, I don't know how the government or how we as a society want to deal with this. Is that a good thing? Like, it makes sense, right? Like, you create something, you should be able to distribute it how you want. But I don't know. Like, this this seems like the same problem all over again. It seems like like home video, the idea of watching film at home completely changed how the dynamic of the system and the laws have never really caught up. I don't, yeah, I think it's too late. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think you're like, right. I don't even know what, what you would do. Like, I, 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 I mean, I honestly haven't put a good five minutes of thought into it, but I, I don't know what you would even do to stop them at this point other than split up their company. Right. Like, yeah, like, I mean, you, yeah, there's no, there's no way you could tell Disney, sorry, you can't own a streaming platform anymore. Like you just can't. Yeah. Uh, you can't. Do I mean, that. The, the only, the only way you could do that is, is to say, you have a monopoly. We're going to cut this apart from this over here. And, but I, I don't, I don't know if that would fly though. Like, cause, cause it's, it's funny. What it reminds me of is like vertically integrated companies who own like resource extraction factories and sales points. Th- those mm-hmm. have always been allowed. And that's all this is really. Um, sure, it's, sure. it's just, this is an entertainment. <laughs> so it seems different. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and, and I think we have to remember that the reason why the studios were split up in the first place was because this was bad. It was it was not good for the industry. And and many in the industry were clamoring for this. And that's why the government responded. So I, I don't I don't know. I like I, I, I agree with you that I don't think this is fixable, but I just wonder where that what that looks like yeah. 20 years from now. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Yeah, that's 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 my that's pretty much my whole take right now is either it's just going to look like a monopoly or the government's going to split it up because it looks too much like yeah. a monopoly. Well, interestingly, like, so this is one last thing. Disney sold 40% of movie tickets last year. And with the addition of Fox, the, the estimate is that number this year will be above 50%. Wow. <laughs> and so, and so at what point, at what point do we say we have a monopoly? Like if, if, if 51% of all movie tickets sold go to one company, at what point, at what point is that true? Is it a monopoly truly there? Right? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Cause it's weird. Right. Because like market share in that regard is different. It's not, it's not like a, like a consumable good. Yeah. Right. Like well, it's not like, it's not like widgets. The, like I, I just, so, so I would, I would say that it already is functioning in a in a highly market distorting fashion, it, sure. it, it, once you have a company that's like it's not monopoly per se, it's having a company so big that they dictate prices, and I I think that they may already be in that position. I mean I mean mm-hmm. that they, they are like like you just you just talked about how they can say like yeah we're not going to let you show our movie because does that doesn't work out for us. Like that, that's, that's basically them dictating prices effectively. They're, they're, they're manipulating things beyond their own company so that things work out in their favor. And that's distortionary. And that's exactly the kind of, that that's exactly why we have antitrust laws is to to preserve market efficiency and protect the consumer. So I would argue we're already there. Um, but it doesn't seem like I, I, I've literally not heard a peep from anyone (laughs) <laughs> in in the regulatory sense saying that any action was going to be taken about this so i, I yeah i mean i i don't, I don't even know like even if a, a, a less pro business administration takes over in 2020 i don't even know if that happens you right. know like i i don't think like even if a democrat had won the presidency in 2016 i don't think they would have actually stopped the fox merger um yeah I mean, especially Hillary Clinton. I d- definitely don't think she would have stopped the Fox merger. But I, I, it is it is very fascinating to see. Like, you're you're absolutely right, and and it's not there. There are so many bigger problems that 
the administration is facing no. right now. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is our top concern. But it is, I, I agree with you that like there are entire regulatory boards and uh, organizations that exist to monitor this type of thing and react to it. And we have not seen anything. So I, I think, I think it's going to be interesting in a, a year from now when Disney plus has been out for a year and we start seeing numbers of like subscriber base and like, if they own 50 over 50 percent of ticket sales and they own over 50 percent market share of streaming services like it it truly gets to be ridiculous yeah i i we'll see you know if if they if they abuse it and people start complaining that that takes things in one direction but right right and i think this is i think stuff like this like the the rep screenings is a way where that starts to build right and i and i and that is why i think they have been very secretive about it is because like you make a big announcement like this you tick some people off some people start calling people and and people start paying attention and looking into this stuff and then you realize you start really digging into the stuff and that's when that's when balls start rolling that uh, yeah that disney does yeah. not want rolling well let's keep an eye on this yeah we will contact our our congress <laughs> little, yeah my, sure why not my my senator uh will definitely do something Okay. That was a joke. Good. I live in Texas. Uh -huh. All right. So that that is ending on some business. Remember when we were talking about ping pong? No. <laughs> all right, guys, that is all we had for you this week. Uh, if you have any opinions on ping pong, the animation on that Star Wars trailer and the Star Wars new trilogy and Disney and the rep screening, uh, we're going to link that article we Matt and I talked about in our show notes. So really recommend you read that and let us know what you think about it. Are, are you... Are you worried? Are you worried about this? Are you worried about the state of cinema? Is is it even cinema anymore? Do you agree with Martin Scorsese? <laughs> don't do not do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not. <laughs> but reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or, or you can always contact us on Twitter at doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And you can find all our shows over at our website, doofmedia.com. Um, what other shows should we talk about today, Matt? Let's talk about our book club that's coming up today, if you're listening to this when it came out, on the 25th of October. That's right. We're going to be covering Middle Game by Seanan... McGuire. Oh, oh McGuire. There's McGuire, no yes. there's no O. There's oh, no sorry. O. Just McGuire. I will. I will get this person's name right at some point. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to be a good talk, and we'll be doing that tomorrow, the twenty fifth of October at nine thirty p.m. Central Time. So, uh, come hang out with us and talk about this book. I love the book club is one of the most fun things we do. And if you're listening to this podcast and you've never hung out with us on a book club, strongly recommend you do it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so, and then there's still there's a Halloween themed do the right thing prompt this mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts as well. Every review helps us um, get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. Yeah, and we actually do have a new review this week, Matt. I, I forgot to pull it, so I'm frantically searching for it right now on my phone. But we do have a new review from Patrick. Patrick, who gives us five stars and says insightful analysis. This podcast has brought me many wonderful takes from Matt Scott and the occasional guest. They have great insight into uh, what makes media good and bad. I especially love their review of Undertale. Yeah, I like oh, that episode a lot. Thanks. Thanks, y'all, for the, the content. You're welcome, Patrick. Thank you for the review. And uh, we will re read all your reviews if you send them to us. So, so do that. Yeah. Uh, and... One last thing before we go, we have to give a special thanks to our patron, Nuke Noodles, who made this episode possible. We would not have uh, made this episode without Nuke Noodles. We would not have watched this ping pong anime that I surprisingly enjoyed. So thanks, yeah. Nuke Noodles. We appreciate your support. This is ominous, Scott. We're working up quite a number of animes that you have had moderate to positive opinions of. I know. I think what's happening is I'm just so inundated with it that I have just I like it now. No, also, it can't I, be. I mean, I think maybe also people have been showing us a broader variety of anime than we would have otherwise ever seen. I think we've done enough of these episodes now where people kind of have a good grasp on the things that we like, and they are specifically trying to find us stuff that, that we would like. So 
I think, I think you're right. I think. I think you're right. Yeah, less uh, less magical schoolgirls, more uh, <laughs> bald men playing ping pong. Yep. Uh, so thanks again, Nuke Noodles. And if you want to support us just like Nuke Noodles did, uh, you can become a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash Doof Media. Pledge a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Tons of great bonus content and uh, and uh, other features and rewards. I don't know what to call. You get stuff. You get stuff. Yeah, the things, you yeah. know. So do that. Do that. Yeah. Help us out. It, it, every every cent we earn goes back into our company and, and helps us uh, pay for our equipment, pay for hosting, keep the lights on, all that good stuff. So we do really appreciate Nuke Noodles and all of you guys who uh, keep us running. We really, really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Thanks so much. All right, guys. That is it for us this week. We will be back next week with M. Night Shyamalan and The Visit. Matt, it's going to be perfect. We'll be recording our episode on Halloween night and talking about a spooky movie. Oh, my God. That is perfect. It's Can't almost wait. It's almost as if I planned it, except I didn't because our schedule got messed up because of Matt's laser eyes. Yeah. And also, I might have to take kids trick-or-treating on Halloween night and not be able to record. But Wait, at you know, 930? We'll That's not safe. Oh, 930? Well, it's 8. Well, 8, 830, 8, 30, my time. We might have to. Well, we can make it late if you can swing we'll figure that. figure it out. Well, yeah, yeah, that's not any of your concern, listeners. <laughs> I might just cut this. Good night. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.